Hey guys, Akiva and Dave back for another episode of the Gathering of the Giga Hash. Everything about mining during this bear market. And today with us, we have Joe from Network Bix Crypto. How are you doing, Joe? Welcome, Joe. Oh, great. How are you? We're good. We're good. Happy New Year and all that jazz. Happy New Year. Um, Thanks for having me. So the first question, first question we're asking everyone, um, because it seems that it's what everyone in the... Everyone outside of the crypto industry and probably 50% of people in, inside it believe that crypto mining is dead, especially for home miners. What's your thoughts on that? How many times have we heard that? <laughs> A million. All right. It, we'll, get, we'll get through it. It's. I think we're just at the beginning. There's, this what, is, uh, what makes, you, it's going what makes you feel that way? There's going to be ups and downs in any economy. Uh, I know with what happened with uh, Ethereum, all that hash power spilled onto other um, other chains and made them less profitable. Electricity rates are up, but it'll level off eventually. Um, we're just in a bear market as well. I, it's not. It's painful for everyone right now, even if you're not on the GPU mining side. Um, I so am still so hopeful. kind of. So, so post merge and obviously with energy going up, are you? Do you still have anything on? I know a lot of miners are sort of switching things. I've off. not really done a whole whole lot of GPU mining, so I've mostly been in the alternative mining space. Some would call it, uh, some would call it Web three or Tippins, uh, token incentivized public infrastructure networks. But primary example would be Helium, and that was mostly what my channel was based around. Then other do it yourself projects, decentralized VPNs. Um, other IoT based or wireless based projects, and then just a regular crypto talk. So, um, yeah, I, I can't say I'm too deep in the GPU or ASIC side, but other side of crypto, and that's what I want to kind of cover in this show because I think a lot of you know a lot of the crypto miners out there are put off by the other side of of mining the alternative mining which i, I wouldn't mm -hmm. call it mining i'd call it earning because mining is the participation in the consensus of a blockchain right so you would call these uh, proof of participation projects potentially but we call them tippins uh where like with helium the the idea was to create a ubiquitous network that IoT devices can run off. So the Internet of Things, it's a multi-billion dollar economy, soon to be a trillion dollar economy. One of the and examples I always hear with regards to like the Helium network is a really good example that kind of made it clear to me when I was first starting. Like I still, like full disclosure, don't know a lot about tip-ins and the mm -hmm. IoT aspects of mining. Um, I'm primarily a GPU miner. I have cheap power, so I get to mine still. Um, I was told that like, say like one of those scooter rental companies that are in like the major cities, they need to yeah. find their scooters. And then they list out onto their network that they're trying to find the scooters. And then mm -hmm. it bounces through the LoRaWAN network. And then when they find the scooter, that comes back. And whoever finds the scooter essentially is mining the block. So like, like if you were to put it, no, not style, at all. Like you get paid to be used yeah. as the network. So there is the utility side of it, which is the hotspots. They are providing that wireless coverage. Then there's a consensus side of it. And it's never been a proof of work network. Initially, when it was all Raspberry Pis, it was <clears> called uh, asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerant, where there was just a random selection of what the nodes were in the consensus group. Then they move to like a somewhat of a proof of stake model because you do have to stake, but they're still using that same asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerant protocol consensus mechanism for that validator selection. So they didn't start out with validators, but they moved to it. But at one point, your hotspot mined because it was participating in, in creating the blockchain. But once they went to light hotspots, that was no longer a thing. So then all you were doing was providing coverage, which, I mean, people use, they both, they conflate the terms, earning, mining, whatever, whatever you want to call it. So if people say mining with their hotspot, I, ju I just go with it. But the point is that um, 
what you're doing is, in a sense, what you said was right. But let's say I have I have a device like this, or it could be uh, much smaller. But this is from Seed Studio, and um, it's a mapping device. It has a, a small GPS unit in it, battery, and a screen. And I can see, like, if I were to turn this on, there's really no hot spots around me out here. And it's dead. Wonderful. <laughs> Didn't come prepared. But the point is, so you can use this wireless coverage for, for many things. Um, GPS is one of them. But th that whole Lime scooter thing, um, basically, it was like attaching the GPS to the, to the fleet of scooters. You'd know where they are at any time. Same with cars, pets. Uh, shipping devices, but the what's different about that type of network is it runs on the ISM band, which so Wi-Fi would be considered an ISM band, an industrial, scientific, and medical band, open to the public for use. That's why you can run your home routers on them without a license. Same thing with LoRa. So here in the U.S., it's 902 to 928 megahertz. It's much lower on the free on the spectrum of radio frequencies, and that whole band is much quieter. You have much less interference. So it's like uh, ham radio, isn't it? In a sense, similar to it, yeah. And th the essence of it is that the LoRa modulation is very simple and very resilient. So if I have a device. I don't have any of my other devices with me right now, other because I had some good examples. We well, had a broken one somewhere around there. Yeah, Let's use that as an example. Oh no, the, <laughs> the other. Well, well, we can talk about that project <laughs> later on. Um, the the point is, it doesn't transfer a lot of data. Like you're you're transferring like bytes per second, where you're, you know, if your phone is plugged into Wi-Fi you're transferring megabits per second so but but it's for very simple uses it's for a device that only has one purpose whether it be like a barometer to measure uh the pressure or air sensor you know gps tracker that just sends back so with a gps it would actually pull station from the satellite directly and then send that back send the coordinates back over the network but the signal can go for, I mean, if you look at the world record of how long, how far someone has gotten a lower WAN message, it's like, it's, it's like over a thousand miles, I think. Or so would it, very it, close to it. would it be feasible for like people to use this to like monitor the oceans, for example, because like there would yeah. be like, you could have access points at like coastal cities or whatnot, yep. and then it could go out to the buoys. And that's kind of a awesome Perfect. way to put it. I've, I didn't even ever think of that kind of use. Thanks for opening my eyes to that. Yeah, so real simple stuff. You know, if you want to monitor the um, moisture of the soil in your farms, you know, at your farm, you can actually automate it. There is such thing as uh, industrial IoT. So uh, my background is I'm a Cisco network engineer. I work in infrastructure or company like Right now, I work for a company that provides wireless coverage to massive venues, hotels, convention centers. Um, so I'm pretty well versed in the wireless space, which is why I can explain this fairly easily. But just having that um, having that understanding of the network really gives me a leg up in this space. I'm sure like uh, Akiba, you're very technical. I'm sure that helps you understand blockchain. Dave, I'm not sure how, how technical you get. Right. I get pretty technical. Uh, like currently, I'm working with the developer of Wildrig um, with the mining of Nexa, and uh, we've been doing a lot of optimizations on that. This is uh, probably a nice hot take that nobody else has either. Um, but yeah, we're like four versions ahead. We're just waiting for another miner nice. to drop right now, and mm -hmm. then we're just gonna go. Oh yeah, really? Here, try this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, it's, so it's fun. You know, you're you're. Um adaption rate of understanding this technology is, is well beyond what most other people uh, would be. So because of that, now you have a podcast, uh, is strong a in this channel. I have a YouTube channel and we explain this to the public and it's all good. Right. But uh, I don't, I forget what I was getting at here. 
point being a great idea. Now we can talk about the leadership, the roadmap, how it, you know, it, it may be unsat. That's a different discussion. But the idea I'm trying to get across is this model does have substance to it. You can get people to do things in the promise of earning tokens. And if, if you were to, if you had to pay people dollars for setting up a hotspot in their house, they wouldn't earn anything because you can't just make dollars like you can crypto. But if you say we're going to give you a token and you can optimize your setup and it would possibly be worth more and we're going to see a pump every couple of years. So probably will pay off itself. It might do a moonshot. Who knows? They're going to have that incentive to stand up this infrastructure. And that is like the second phase of crypto. So we've seen a lot of other projects within this space, other wireless projects. So you have things like uh, Pollen Mobile and XNet, which are both uh, CBRS, uh, Citizens Broadband radio service which is they call it open 5g but it's really 4g um there is like a public broadcast yeah so helium's actually doing that as well so if you wanted to buy a cell phone plan with your solana phone from helium you could if you were in range of a helium 5g hotspot you would utilize that for internet connectivity but otherwise you'd roam onto the t-mobile network now, with Pollen, it's a more of a private network. Like, I'm fairly certain Amazon is standing up their own CBRS, the private CBRS network. So if there's a company that is within range, like, they would pay to utilize that for whatever they want to run um, on that network. Yeah, Amazon, I, I think I heard Amazon's doing it for their automated fleets, right? The automated trucks that they're going to yeah. be having on the road shortly. Yeah, so I don't know how you're – maybe it's possible to rival them. The, the problem with the CBRS, 4G, 5G coverage, whatever, it, it just does not have the the reach that something like Laura, Laura Wan would have, right? Because that's maybe half a mile, maybe a little bit more. And are you going to get enough people to stand up the, the equipment that costs like two grand – for CBRS, but someone has to try it, and I applaud them for doing so. You have other tipping projects, like one's called Foam. Uh, Foam.space is their website, and their goal is to set up a ground-based GPS system, and they have what's called um, proof of location, but it's also using the LoRa modulation, and you have four anchors, which are antennas that they're, they have line of sight to each other. And then the device that is uh, na navigating or roaming using that service is being triangulated by that, you'd call it a TDOA, time differentiation of arrival. So it sends out that RF broadcast and based on how long it takes, like fractions of a second to get to the anchors, that are other antennas, you're able to decipher a very precise location of where that where that um, device is. Let me know if I'm not explaining this correctly. So but, pretty much, if I need to find my AirPods, I can find my AirPods. Well, the the goal is to eventually yeah, sorry, make it. I was just trying to over no, I, I know, I know you're joking. <laughs> um, yeah. I stuck at humor. Yeah. Uh, but the the goal is to have a. a a navigational system that is an alternative to what we currently have, because uh, if, if we're go to go to war with another a major player, first thing that would probably happen is uh, satellites would be shot out of the sky and that would bring our um, civilization. Well, what do you want to call it? That, that our modern really, technological age to us stand yeah, still. You know, no, no one would be able to order their DoorDash or browse on <laughs> Tinder and all hell would break loose, right? But you wouldn't be, most people wouldn't be able to navigate because we rely on maps for everything. So 
Maybe it's a little bit of a stretch. Someone has to try. They're a very sophisticated group, but they also have the idea of proof of location where if you want a timestamp on the blockchain for where you were at a given point in time, you can utilize that system to do so. So, That's so, oh, so, so, so with, with, all, with all of that, and I mean, you're obviously very passionate about sort of lower networks and IoT, mm -hmm. and I, I completely get behind it. It goes beyond that. that. Yeah, but, that was the yeah. reason why I got a helium miner, um, because I, I just saw the utility, I saw IoT growing as an industry, like you're saying, made a lot of sense. But I bought a helium miner for like, say, $400 or whatever. And I think I've mined probably about $20 from it mm -hmm. since. How, how is it profitable? And why, so why are you in that industry, given that one of the other options is obviously just to buy helium tokens, mm -hmm. which I, I could no, have bought $500 question. on helium tokens. And well, they'd probably still be worth about 20 quid now if I'd bought them at the time. But um, yeah, why go the way that you're going? Well, I haven't been necessarily dead set. I, put it this way. I haven't been expanding my fleet. I've actually been selling it. So okay. I still cover the project because I think it's worthwhile. And too, there is a lot of what I like about it is that you can utilize the network, but you have so many different features to it you have ways to modify your setup to potentially earn more so it's very engaging with you know with the general audience and mm -hmm. with my background i just think think it's it's um i guess you'd say revolutionary in the sense that it provides a solution that nobody has been able to do with the, with the internet of things so mm -hmm. That's that's why I focused on it. But another part of it is because I have not seen any. I've seen a few projects, I guess, not not including the blockchain. Because I, I think blockchain is side is pretty solid. If you have a good blockchain, you have a good use case. But within the alternative mining space, there are just so many solutions looking for problems, mm -hmm. scams, bullshit. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I shouldn't swear on your podcast, but um, yeah, it's so th I've looked at other projects as well. I've mined some other projects, covered the technology of other ones. So another another example of a tipping would be a decentralized VPN. Mm -hmm. Now, is the demand really there for it? A little bit, because for some like the web scraping that people would want to do you would typically need a residential IP address, which there are companies who do web scraping. They're willing to pay you to utilize your IP address for 10 minutes. So pardon you know, my the, ignorance, but what is web scraping? So web scraping would be like what Google would do to index all of the information on, on a page, right? So they, they want to, Maybe just scrape it from another search engine. Maybe they're uh, running checks on all the different IP addresses and then browsing directly to, to that website. What, gotcha. I think a, a good aspect. example the is... The point being... Go ahead. So I'm just going to say a good example is there's lots of companies that will do like LinkedIn web scraping where you'll tell yeah. them that yeah. you want exactly. like the information for people that work in the tech industry in L.A. And then they will go through LinkedIn and scrape all the data and then give that to you. That's oh, okay. That's I got you. So, but I here, understand here's, now. I've just never heard it. Very great got you. So, you know when you have to fill out the CAPTCHA, you have to keep clicking those stupid boxes? So when you're web scraping and you have an, an automated program that's going through and collecting all this information, eventually, because they, they track your web use, who the website or possibly, Possibly a search engine or whoever catches on to the fact that it's a bot doing it and they've put in captures to slow it down. So these companies will want to hop from IP address to IP address to continue their scraping. And that's why a decentralized VPN has some use cases, but I don't, I think it's far and few between. But basically, so, it's like people. But wouldn't a decentralized VPN work for people like in China where they're behind the Great Wall, like? 
blockade yeah. or whatever and the hell that is. So, so the best thing about a decentralized VPN is it means that your data, your original like traffic history is not stored anywhere. So with a centralized one, like say NordVPN or I use CyberGhost, great services, mm -hmm. but ultimately they will have your IP address on their server because they can't not. And theoretically, they can be subpoenaed by a government to give mm -hmm. you that, to force that information um, because it is stored somewhere. With a decentralized one, that's impossible. And it's it's kind of similar with like the, say, the Tor network and um, yeah. there's another one, uh, the free internet project or something it's called like those separate internets are kind of a similar thing so if you want to let someone use your ip address you can earn off of that and it doesn't actually have to be crypto necessarily there are other ones that pay like cents a day however i don't necessarily recommend that to people unless you know what you're getting into like oh, a sure. lot of people who participated got um they got notifications from their ISPs saying, we think there's a device that's been hacked on your on your network. Uh, you're sending out mm -hmm. spam messages, you know, some like mm -hmm. set up a POP3 network using their or POP3 server, relay server using their mm -hmm. IP or um, someone's torrenting over their network. So there are some legal liabilities are at, at least you may in, initially take the blame for what someone else does with your IP address. In in the UK, you're legally responsible for any traffic that goes on inside your own network. So if you do do that and then someone's something illegal, the person like whose home it is will, the person that's responsible ultimately could end up going mm -hmm. to jail for it. So it is something you really need to understand what you're doing if you're in a country like, say, the UK. Um, uh, that's just forefront security to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but just, there, just there are it. tons of decentralized just, stepping back ever so slightly because again it really interesting use cases and showcasing how um technology can be used in different ways uh, for rewarding people using blockchain technology for utility but just to jump back then into you say you're selling some some of, some of your miners so what what are you looking at for the future what's your kind of your, your goal within what you're mining or earning or participating in um is it a uh, Obviously, you, you've stated that to a degree, it's also like the hobby aspect of it. It's something that you're passionate yeah, about. It's it's also get, so I would mm -hmm. like to get into the GPU side. Um, a, I'd like to buy a few ASICs. Basically, I'm okay. just broke right now. I have kids, so that's mm -hmm. where my money goes. Um, but that is where I'd like to end up, uh, you know, whatever other type of like setting up a flux node. I find flux to be extremely interesting. Another one I do is threefold. I have one of one of their nodes, so similar to Flux, where you're you basically hosting a server, you're letting out processing power, IP space, um, storage, and someone can host uh, a workload on on the device. So I have one of those. Whatever whatever I find to be interesting and having you know, potential and use cases, where I'll go. So, so given your, your experience, like from a professional standpoint within networking, what do you, what do you think has been the problem with things like helium? Um, given that you're saying like you're, you're currently selling some miners, you're wanting to get into GP mining. Are you, that sounds quite bearish on the whole of industry. Is there anything you can give insight to where you think it's going wrong? If it is. Well, with helium, I've been one of their outspoken critics. But I think um, there is some lack of understanding of the crypto space. Basically, the, the what it is for me is I had a fairly large, I would I'd say a mediocre size fleet of helium miners. But after you get more than five, you need to figure out where to put them, who's going to take them at, at their house, how to optimize that. Sometimes you have to go visit because one of them went offline, try to figure out. And, and it just becomes not really worth the hassle when you're um you know when you're not making a whole lot every month and then these people are still wondering how much money they're going to make um it, so yeah in that sense because we're not really seeing those you know the returns that we were during that bull market um 
I just don't find it worth it to be managed, managing the fleet. Now, as far as helium and where I'm wrong, there's, I believe, some issue with the leadership. You can see that. Um, there was a whole discussion about it on my channel. We did a live stream with some, um, some actually people trying to build on the network that have been IoT professionals for years, basically uh, chewing up the Helium Foundation about how they pushed out a change in frequency plan in the, the Australian region, which made a bunch of IoT devices un unable to join the network and function prop properly. So there are people who want to use this to build on, but there's been uh, some haphazardly uh, processes where this is this is a production network now. You have people who want to use this network to track valuable belongings, to potentially have services like I, I know there's people talking about doing doing like a, like a senior citizens um, alarm type of deal that they have on them at all times, and if they're mm -hmm. they're in trouble or they're injured, they they can press it, and most likely they're going to be in range to to uh, send out a notification to their loved ones to, to check in on them, right? Well, if you're on a production network and you have those type of services, whether it's a blockchain or not, you uh, whether it's a crypto project or not, you cannot just haphazardly push changes without documentation, without a rollout procedure, without letting the entirety of the community know that that is taking place. And mm -hmm. that's what happened. There, there right. was also some issues in the in the terms, I believe, in voting. Um, the the system that that they have right now, it may be similar to other systems that we see in voting, where it's weighted based on the amount of tokens you or coins or tokens you hold in your wallet, right? Um, make of it what you will, but what it comes down to in the end is public perception, whether they feel that they're getting a fair shake in the branded people's network or not and many of the the wider general community who bought in do not um hip 51 where there were more tokens created and then hnt became the main token where now supposedly sometime soon you're well not supposedly but sometime in the future we don't know what date because we're always behind on um on on uh whatever dates that have been set mm -hmm. always behind schedule on 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 these changes there's the lower wan miners are supposed to go to mining an iot token the 5g open 5g cbrs radios are, are currently mining a mobile token and then there's like this balancing formula as to where you're going to, what, you know, how much HNT you can redeem for the token you have mined, mm -hmm. whether it's IoT or mobile. And that is just so complex for people. They don't understand it. Yeah. For many people, it involves another tax. Um, yeah, true. Because it's yeah. transferring tokens. Yeah. And, so and it, it, it almost makes that actually, they're like algorithmically linked then as well. So it means yeah. that it opens up financial exploits of the network. Should that be the options? It seems like it's over complicating it from my point of view. Um, do, do you still believe look, in the I concept? I said that I got all sorts of help. Oh, certainly I believe in the concept 100%. If helium were to whatever, if, if the network were to go offline and say, and whatever, may happen if they were to close shop there already are competitors popping up there's crank c-r-a-n-k-k.io and then there is things ix things internet exchange they're both born out of that same idea things ix actually they they were trying to develop on the helium network before but they both learned um from the mistakes that were made and look, you can't fault Helium for all the mistakes that were made here because new concept and, um, you know, they're, they're, it's really emerging. It, they, no one's done this before. There's nothing really written 
as far as a uh, uh, manual or procedure or best, best practices are anyone that you can look to for that type of uh, understanding. And it's like they had a lot of events at once that caused this crazy mania with the price. And I actually laid it out pretty well on the um, stream last night. But the time that they were really launching and became in demand like all the hotspots were in demand because, mm -hmm. and the HNT was just starting to pump and make it profitable, is because, of course, altcoins followed Bitcoin. It was on basically with the bull market. It was during the bull market that this was happening. Mm -hmm. But then you had you had uh, other events like you had a massive <clears throat> validator stand up. Where, like I said earlier on in the show, they went from being like these Raspberry Pis hosting the blockchain to uh, validators, where you had to stake 10,000 HNT on validators. 3,000 validators are now online. That locks up tons of liquidity, right? You have a bunch of people speculating. You have all sorts of crazy news about it. People want to buy the token. You have major exchange listings. Uh, you have this crazy amount of data credit being spent. So you would burn HNT to create data credits. And when you, let's say I use data credits to send data to a hotspot, that hotspot would reap that reward. And the Oracle works it out in a way that it adjusts the price accordingly. But you have to have like millions worth of data credits spent to see like a substantial raise in the HNT price. But you did see that because it costed, $55 worth of data credits to, to stand up uh, or to assert a hotspot, right, that uh, the manufacturer paid. So there was a lot of usage there, which further caused increase in price. So you've seen this, you know, this moonshot that really wasn't expected. I don't think the Helium team was expecting it. They're new to crypto. I think they've uh, not been able to grasp some of how should I say it? I don't think they understand the mining community. Put it that way. Right. They're they're network guys. They they want to build a decentralized network, but mm -hmm. through mining or through crypto, that's their that's the icing on the cake. That's what mm -hmm. finally gets them that decentralized infrastructure. For pe that's what motivates people to stand up that infrastructure. Otherwise, it wouldn't really be profitable with just fiat money. Because like I said, you can't just print fiat money. But yeah, there was a lot of... I can't fault them completely for it, but there's certainly failure to adapt. I don't want to spend the whole show just talking about the, them. because the, there are The other bad ones. taste in my mouth that was left through those helium miners was like, as you guys know, as I ordered an abundance of those miners, I waited two years to get them and they never arrived. When I called all the manufacturers, I was told, oh yeah, it's going to be in the next order. It's going to be in the next order. It's going to be in the next order. Yeah. Never, next order never came. You know what I mean? So then I just ended yeah, up having to cancel understand. all of them. And thankfully, my credit card company, because if, you, if I don't receive anything from the product that I order, there's a five year limit for me to cancel the transaction and to fight it to get the reverse. And, so, and the fiasco just continues to build where these many of these companies like I'm not I'm just not going to name names. The ones that get caught cheating and the ones that really didn't have good management practice and didn't understand the business side of things they're going bankrupt or they've just been banned from the network so they're no longer supporting people who have hotspots on the network these hotspots go offline so now helium has to scramble the uh, nova labs helium foundation they have to scramble to uh come up with a solution to a vendor that they Get, I don't know. They accepted um, th their app application onto the network, basically. And it's kind of been like the whole, the entirety of the time, it's been said by the official Helium Foundation, Nova Labs, we can't be held accountable for what, what they do. All we did through HIP-19 was um, we, we reviewed their hardware 
is basically what it came down to. Was it a competent model of hardware that would provide good coverage for the network? And if it was, and they provided some bits of proof that they could possibly manufacture it, they were accepted. Cough, so, synchro bit, cough. Now, <clears throat> <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I have a personal story about them. Yeah, me no, too. Um, me too. <laughs> so, so if I told you then, if I told you, you can go to any store that, well, I guess any online store that sells a generic Lorwan gateway, or you could do it with a Raspberry Pi, or maybe even do it with that old Linksys router that you're doing with it before. Would you participate in another network? Yeah. Every day. Well, there that is it would it would IF. be it would be akin it would be akin to me going and buying a GPU to mine with and not get it for two years. You understand? It yeah, would be I like totally me buying a 3090 at the beginning of 2020 and then it mm -hmm. comes in yesterday. Well, like I totally doesn't... get it. Look, I I've, I've had so many people write to me about this and I, I feel bad because it feels like someone got left on the sidelines and didn't get to enjoy the fun. You know, this was a fun experience for me and for other people. It was like soul crushing. It sucked to watch other people be upset over something I had, you know, passion for. So oh, it was hilarious when I saw my friends getting their minors like a year before I got mine and I was the one who told yeah. them to go pick them up. <laughs> it was the best, the best. Yeah, it was a weird project, man. Did they do well? Anyways, if, 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 uh, do you have anything else on uh, this topic right now? If not, I'm kind of just asking. No, let's them. move on. going to ask the direction of Network Bits and where he's planning on going in the future. Yeah. Uh, really, yeah. really uh, anywhere. I What I want to start doing is building on Flux. I really like that project. I like their attitude. I like their development and the whole concept behind it. It's it's really I would consider it a, a tipping, right? They do have network set, network centric features, or at least they plan on implementing it. Like a, they were talking about a load balancer between Web two and three recently, right? I mean, how can you not call yourself a network at this point? Uh, but some people would say it's Web three. Some people would say it's decentralized hosting. However, you want to quantify it, it's the same model getting people to provide a service and this is talking about the nodes right not the gpu miners because the gpu mining is the blockchain but still um the you know nodes that are going to run server loads for people who want to start a web website or host a game server or whatever it may be and they don't have to be utilizing the same companies that have stuck it to us for the past decades mm -hmm. the big you know the big um data companies corporate amazon google microsoft, microsoft. Mm -hmm. so it's taking taking the power back to the people and have passive earnings you know one of my that, um, really good friends that um, I think you're familiar with, uh, Red Fox Crypto, he actually mines exclusively Flux at the moment. Um, he's been a huge proponent of Flux ever since I first came across him. Since we've been first became friends, he's been a huge proponent of Flux. He's always had rigs on it. Obviously, he was mining Ethereum when it was profitable too mm -hmm. before the merge. Um, but since then, he's also on the Flux. And he brought it to my attention that have you ever noticed the hash rate? of flux like if you discount all of the bull run bs the hash rate has stayed stable so the core miners of the project are still there it's one of like the biggest dynamics that i use in validating a project's worth and value is the miners that are there how long they've been there and why they're still there and if one of those three parts don't add up, I can't. I can't get in. There's no way. And Flux is I, one of the projects project. that every person that I've talked to has been Flux, 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 oh, yeah. Flux, Flux. And, and if I wasn't heating my house with miners right now, I'd be mining Flux. It's just too damn cold when it's freaking minus thirty out. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now that that community is is popping. I mean, they're they're supportive and they're um, they're excited. They're, they're always 
uh, very mm. passionate about about talking about flux. So I like it. It reminds me of like a more matured Zillica community, to be honest with you. Like Zillica is coming out with all these crazy like new projects and stuff that's just like it's mind numbing, like how they would even come up with some of these concepts. But then you see them put it into practice and it's just like, Mwah! that's beautiful. Like, yeah. I love seeing that. Like, that's that just makes perfect sense. Like the Zillica gaming console. I don't know if you've seen any of that. It's out in uh, alpha test or beta test right now. I think there's like mm, 40 so. consoles in the wild. Um, but it's just like a console that is like a it's like any other game console, but you play Web3 based games on it. And when you're not playing Web3 based games, you can mine Zillica on your console, which is kind of like and, dope. And it and it works as a hardware wallet as well. Yeah. Like a like, ginormous hardware wallet. It looks so gangster, man. Like I'm not gonna lie. I'm, I'll check it out. <clears throat> oh, so what one thing I like to what mistakes have you made in mining? And what would you recommend to people that are interested in the space? Oh, one of them, I, I posted this on Twitter. I would not have let one of my buddies talk me into purchasing five grand worth of helium miners with his money that I have to manage. It worked out okay, but not not anything exceptionally well for the headache. I guess good enough for me to understand the system and explain it on here but like i think people who get themselves involved in that type of like infrastructure as investment like if you think you're going to go out and buy a bunch of different devices there's other ones in the space um like it, i know there's people who do gpu mining at other people's house because they have a lower electricity rate i mean just imagine putting like 10 of those at at each one of a different friend's house and always having to go over there for maintenance. It's a pain, but mm -hmm. also imagine that like it just one day is really not that profitable. It makes like 20 cents a day. That That's always the risks that you take with these types of projects. I'm watching a lot of people do the same thing with uh, there's like demo and honey mapper hive mapper. Sorry. So I do have a hive mapper. I've been playing with it for the past couple, uh, couple days, but it's a dash cam that you put on, put in your windshield, and, and their idea is to map the entirety of, of Earth, of the roads that are available to us, and provide that, in, um, provide that data to any business who needs to utilize that for whatever reason. In the same sense that uh, Google would provide provide mapping data and imagery to businesses, right? And then there's Demo, and if I am explaining this correctly, it's more of an analytics gathering one of their – I don't want to misspeak, so I, I won't get too deep into it. Basically, you know how you have, like, ways that tells you there's a slowdown mm -hmm. here, there's a cop here, yeah, there's yeah. whatever, roadblock. Mm -hmm. You're They're trying to report that data back and – they're both supposedly using the Helium network. I don't know. I haven't looked deep enough into it, but it seems like uh, they're both pretty close with Helium. So, uh, no, for me, like, given the size of the Helium network, when I, you look on the map and you see how many there are in, like, say, like in the UK, it's a small country. There's <laughs> thousands of them all across, especially Manchester, where I'm at. Um, I can it, the growth is still there. The infrastructure is being built. That's the thing. Now there's actual miners all across. The use cases uh, are possible. Um, I think that just the the whole space is very, very, very fascinating. But it does seem that they need to get the the tokenomics of all of these things right. And with all these new yeah, projects, well, I it's think it's. Up. I don't know. I think it's it might be a foregone conclusion at this point. Unfortunately, we'll see if they can turn it around. Um, I do think that 2021, like all those events that, that I named there, you know, they had a lot happen during a bull run. So you just mm -hmm. had this like mania in price that came out of nowhere and they didn't really know how to manage it. They didn't know how to set the expectations of the community and it just resulted in 
like outrageous amounts of FUD. I mean, I, I hated even looking at the forums because there were so many people who they didn't have the right expectations. And it was the first go around in yeah. crypto. But it was just like radiating negativity into the mm -hmm. atmosphere. I mean, these everyone was upset and whether it be factually correct or rightfully so because of their situation or maybe not factually correct. If that's how you know you're you're doing a crowdsourced project and the crowd is not loyal to the project, they don't believe in it, they're actually quite against it and the proposals that you're um that you're making then it's kind of hard to sustain something long term like that i mean i guess the bad will wash out and you know maybe only the, the dedicated will be left i don't know but it's i think i think it's also the potential they say that there's potentially some bad leadership i mean ultimately for something that's deemed as the people's network it should be something that has an element of um, democracy with it and within for the actual real people. Because you listed some use cases there around kind of mapping the roads like Google Maps does yeah. or um, checking for the traffic and stuff like you get with Waze mm -hmm. and, pe and like people outside of Web3 will be like, oh, well, we already have that. Why do we need those things? It's because Google, that's the only way you get it. You get it from Google. And maybe from yeah. it's like open maps or something, which is now being created. But ultimately, there's a monopoly on a lot of the infrastructure around the world that people don't understand. And I do think that it's a really salient point that you, you mentioned around, say, like decentralized VPNs. Is like, what's the real use case for it? Well, the use case for all of this stuff, and I think I can completely understand why you're so passionate about these sorts of networks, mm -hmm. is it creates a future that is potentially protection against dictators against bad governments yeah. uh, against globalization exactly. in a bad yeah. form like we need these forms of technology but ultimately people only people, want to use by when, the they, people. when they feel the impact and i think yeah. that is the scary problem and i think it's people like yourself that are building into them even when they're not necessarily profitable because you believe in it that could be that and all it sounds like kind of stupid but the stalwarts for so saving technology, ultimately. There you go, freedom hat. I love my freedom hat. <laughs> now, I, all joking aside, yes, that's that's exactly it. It's yeah. not, So I don't know where else you'd want to be at, in this day and age. You're talking about technology that's going to change the way that the financial system operates and mm -hmm. potentially the and the way we communicate as well if if it all works as according to plan so i'm very excited about that now as they always say technology is overestimated the impact is overestimated short term underestimated long term right technology but, um, has always been a force for governments to take over control of a populace whether it was the development of armaments tanks uh battlements um whether it was uh development of nuclear warheads it's always been there that we need to do, this is just personally what I was just thinking about, we need to do our diligence, due diligence, so that people mm -hmm. can access our networks and just use them yes. against our people. And that's that's what's like makes me very hesitant to work with projects that I catch any kind of like vibe off of that I don't mm -hmm. like. No, I agree. I, I rail against that's what I love about having a YouTube channel. When I say something, and I try to be very careful about what I say, but when I say it, it echoes. Like I crap on you. So many of these companies utilize the Amazon Web Services or Google Cloud to spin mm -hmm. up the validators, right? Yep. Okay, it might be reliable, but have you ever experienced an outage? when your infrastructure is hosted on one of those companies. It happens. And it's going to happen if all the if the majority of your you know uh your infrastructure is hosted there. Hell it happens and you're gonna look, like, you're out it, and you're gonna look like a fucking idiot. Well it yeah, happened it happened here in Canada. We had the ATMs like the banking system. We weren't able to use our bank cards at all not at a store, not at a bank machine, not at the bank, like the entire system just went. And it's like, everyone's like, what the 
like how do i pay for my gas i don't have a credit card like i legitimately don't have credit card oh yeah it's like how do i pay for my gas how do i like what the hell i can't use my banking info this is crazy this is my money but i can't use it yeah mm -hmm. when when there is like even a dns routage or sometimes there's like a, a like a bgp peering issue with the like how the service providers exchange the routing you'll see massive outages between um like AWS or Azure. Um, there's there was another one I forget. They're one of the more mid-sized one. Like they hosted tons of infrastructure, and just all hell breaks loose for me in my department because mm -hmm. we work on the network, and everyone that thinks it's our equipment that's gone down, right? But I'm kind of like going to savor the next time that happens to AWS, and I'm just gonna get on the internet. And keep checking to see if if Ethereum has gone down, because that's where they're yeah. hosting the majority of their validators. Yeah, it's like over sixty percent. And like I think, yeah, if you've got Azure, you've got Google, um, you've got uh, AWS, and you've also got Cloudflare, which is obviously mm -hmm. the layer between. Which, when if that goes down, there's also major oh, issues. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's all intertwined. And this is the thing, though, like when. Like whenever Facebook goes down, it's usually because of either Cloudflare or AWS. Um, and people people just talk about Facebook being down uh, or WhatsApp being down or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they don't understand that this is part of the core problem with the centralization yeah. that we can look to solve. Um, what would you say, what do you think the future is for uh, tipping networks? And is there anything that you're, super excited about this year um given that pretty much everyone's pretty bearish about 2023 is there any glimmer of hope or anything you think is exciting coming up i haven't made up my mind whether i think it's going to be um whether i, I don't think it's going to be as bad as everyone's expecting i'm sure there, there's still going to be a drag but i think there's going to be uh some upsides throughout the year just you know i'm hearing this secondhand from a lot of smart people who actually analyze the numbers i just look at the tech right so even though the economy overall is shit, uh i don't necessarily think that will entirely be the case for crypto um my what i'm excited for is actually building out web3 and like i'd like to start a, a website on something like flux or threefold right but trying to understand how we can better utilize this infrastructure and and start you know you have to be an early adapter so you can say this doesn't work this works this is the crappy user experience and mm -hmm. work with the projects to make it more competitive i believe that's how you that is how you pump your own investment right mm -hmm. if you can use it and you can help them make a better service then or if you're you have a podcast or you're a YouTuber or whatever it is, um, just just trying to move. Um, I, I, I'm I'm drawing a blank on what I want to say, but just pushing it in a little bit more positive of, of a direction could pay off dividends in the end, maybe. Um, but I like to use my play platform like i said to help people understand but like give them the mission like what do we what's the whole purpose of this it's for our mm -hmm. privacy it's so we're our data is no longer being harvested we're no longer being sucked dry of every last cent by the the big tech communists and we're no longer being surveilled by our government that is what i would like to see out of this now i can't say i'm necessarily uh i'm entirely hopeful i'll make the effort but i'm not sure the average person cares about this but there yeah. are there are other projects in the space that are emerging as well that it looks think, like it's for i think i think i think the way you're looking at it isn't correct I don't think that the average person knows that they need to care about this. 
that's what I, 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 it's not that they don't care. It's that they don't know that this is something that matters and is going to matter very, very soon. And it's either going to be put in the right direction or in the wrong direction. And in the wrong direction, we get failed, failed, failed projects in the right direction. We get, uh, I don't want to say utopia, but like we get some kind of control over our own freedom like yeah our uh, control over our own destination you know what i mean like yes i i agree now don't go mining and then put all your money into like you know coinbase or something because like that'd just be silly (laughs) but like (laughs) you know i mean sorry just talking about decentralized the whole thing is like empowering the individual right giving Mm -hmm. them their their share in the economy through because they're providing that service, right? That's the new economy uh, the model. Um, protecting their data, their privacy, giving them autonomy over their identity, whether it be, you know, whatever. On the blockchain, if they want to use NFTs, whatever. Um, I think NFTs are good for authentication purposes. My, uh... My buddy has been using them for tickets to his comedy show. Like when he sells tickets to his comedy show, he sells an NFT. He has like this little freaking, I forget That's what the, OpenSea, is that what it's called? Mm-hmm. Something like that. And then you get the OpenSea app and then you get the, the ticket stub. And then mm-hmm. on the ticket stub, it's like every ticket stubs its own individual picture. That's like, mm-hmm. he picked them all. I, like and everything. That it's I kind of cool. really like that idea because people love saving, saving, the tickets of the concerts and shows that they want to. So that is yep. an outstanding idea. Yeah, no, I mean, but, um, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, it's a whole different topic, but N- N- NFTs and uh, collectibles, I, it's definitely going to be the future. I think I was talking about it on another podcast in that I, my shelf behind me has got loads of like old like Mega Drive games and N64 games and, and the such. Um, any sort of items or things that I did in those saves is probably long gone now. Whereas if they were Web3 mm-hmm. games, then I'd have those memories uh, in a digital format that I could look back on. Um, and people buy, like, you try and buy, like, that's, that's Smash Brothers on the N64. That's probably, like, 80 bucks online now. Um, and people will buy it, even if they don't have an N64 <laughs> console, just to display it somewhere. Like, that's what NFTs in gaming, especially, are going to be for sort of the Gen Z generation, I think. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, like, so one of the things that I think is absolutely fascinating uh, about your channel is you say your your technical understanding of the hardware, given that it's something that is an industry that you're in. And the fact that if you just just scanning through the last videos that you've done, there's a whole heap of different projects, different types of miners, devices to learn about. And I think that's one of the things that for anyone watching, if you if it's kind of got your interest around, you've only been known about, say, like CPU mining or GPU mining, like, Check out Joe's channel, Network Bits uh, on YouTube. There's tons of different um, pieces of hardware that you're just dicking around with and learning to see whether they're they're good or, or bad or whatnot. And Every video that like, Joe's put out, great. I've learned something from personally. So like mm-hmm. like legitimately every video I've watched of his, even like the long form streams of nonsense, it's like <laughs> like there's pieces of gold in there. So like it's it's parts of aspects that I personally wouldn't have thought of. So yeah, I have to give my credits where I have to give credit where credits due. And you're kicking ass, man. And keep using both feet because we need people like you in this space. Yeah, we we get pretty rowdy, but we try to keep it also very intelligent. You know, Mm -hmm. you gotta do both. Well. Keep it up in 2023. Maybe there'll be a new project. I mean, the best projects are born out of bear markets. So with all the issues going on with helium, um, I don't know, because just think it out loud. If a project could come along and allow people that have a helium miner to just do a firmware update and then move to something else that was better organized, like is that something that theoretically could happen? There are... Are, are you saying um, like repurposing to repurpose, that hardware? Yeah, yeah. yeah. certainly. So you can certainly do that. And uh, there's there's two options right now. The they're like I mentioned earlier on the show, Crank and Things IX. So if you check out my channel, that information is on there. Um, 
Crank only has the Raspberry Pi supported in 2023, so the Raspberry Pi based ones, but Things I Ask will be open to just about any off the shelf Lorwan gateway that you could purchase. So the only downside to that is now you don't have a vendor who's going to push all the updates. You might have to figure out how to do a manual remote access and learn how to do like the, the management yourself, similar to how you would with a, like a, a rig or an ASIC, right? Mm -hmm. So there's that, but it's still like, you know, you're going to get the hardware. You can choose what hardware there's millions of, no, not millions, but thousands of choices, right? And you can customize it and tinker and modify it to potentially earn more through that coverage. So I, I like that. I, I like that idea and I like the useful service that it, it provides. Mm -hmm. I'm down. I'm looking forward to, to seeing what comes with this because it's an industry that I'm fascinated with. Uh, and I'll carry on watching your channel. Dave, um, do you want to sign us off and um, give a, another shout out to Joe? Yeah, just thanks for coming, Joe. I really appreciate you, man. Like, thanks for you, having me. You, you came at the drop of a hat. I really appreciate it. It's It's been clutch. I've, I've been enjoying watching you stream with uh, our other mutual friends, like our first podcast guest, uh, Chump Change. And just yeah, you guys will have that... to come on and you can tell my audience about your podcast and what you guys do. And yeah, you know, I, I I'm always looking for guests, so you're welcome anytime. And like like I said, Akiba, I know you're in the UK, so we can always do a, a Saturday morning or even Sunday morning live stream to to accommodate everyone. As yeah, long as sure, we get our team for Akiba, Gavin. he'll be all right. <laughs> all right, guys. right, well, for this episode of Gathering the Gigahash, thank you very much. I've been Akiba, he's been Dave, this has been Joe, and we'll see you next time. Goodbye. Have a good one, guys.